I'd like to now begin sort of a, a discussion uh, amongst ourselves, uh, beginning maybe Israel and Osama. If Israel, did both of you uh, writing in a new country, did you change your style knowing that you're writing to be translated, or did you just not think about translation and you wrote in the same style? Uh, I wrote it in the, in the same style, the same style. Actually, exile to me is so complicated issue because uh, I think there's two kinds of exile, psychological exile and uh, physical exile. Uh, I have the psychological exile since I was in Syria. Now I have psychological exile and physical exile, <laughs> both. Uh, but uh, I'm always, anyway, I'm always optimistic. I'm trying to be optimistic because I have no chance, I have no choice, and uh, we have to be strong in our life. We have to be harsh. Uh, regarding Syria, I, I lost every, everything there. So I have to start from the beginning now. It's a new life, new start, and uh, uh, I'm writing now more than ever. And uh, well, your 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 stories that are sort of fable poems almost, they are often not very specific to the context in the place. They're no. Uh, they're working. Maybe a word becomes alive or. A, an animal or exactly this, this, is that was have you always written that way and exactly. this is not yeah. a so it's, it's easier now do people read it a different way here even though you're writing the same do people understand it differently i was told here my stories are very strange here <laughs> very strange in what way? as if it were, they were from another planet so <laughs> <laughs> i was told in syria too that they are strange, but here more, more, more strange. <laughs> I'll, I'm glad I'm on this there. side of the earth. <laughs> in Israel, so, for you, that similarly, uh, now that you've been in the States and you've, you've got a very, uh, in Spanish, a very lush, Baroque style, uh, have, you, have you confronted what's that like in, and changed it at all since you've been in the U.S., or do you continue writing the same way? Desde antes de partir, un poco parecido a lo que decía Osama, Mi exilio comenzó hace mucho tiempo, en muchos aspectos. For living, like uh, Osama said, my exile started a long time ago in many different aspects. Uno de ellos fue que fui perdiendo mi audiencia. One of natural. them was that slowly I was losing my natural audience. Por cuestiones de libertad de expresión. Because of lack of uh, freedom of expression. Y acoso. And harassment. Eh, luego también desde el punto de vista estilístico fue, fue, fui evolucionando porque quise interpretar el otro al país que yo vivía no desde el punto de vista realista sino un poco ir un poco más allá also stylistically I kept evolving because I wanted to represent the country in which I was living not only in a realistic manner but I wanted to go beyond that Porque mi país no solamente se ha roto un modo de gobierno, sino que también se ha, ha roto la lógica. Y es, y, y, y es un país fragmentado. Entonces he tratado de buscar un estilo que, o, o una manera de, de escribir narrativa eh, que pueda decir aún más Que lo que nos dice una realidad fracturada, ¿no? y una lógica fracturada. Uh, because in my country, it's not only the government that has been broken, but logic itself is broken. So it's a fragmented country. So I'm trying to find a narrative way that uh, talks uh, beyond this about this fragmented country. Entonces, claro, una vez que vengo acá a los Estados Unidos, ya no tengo. Eh, Tengo que pensar un poco en, 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 en que vengo ya sin audiencia, ¿verdad? Y que la, y que la audiencia a, americana probablemente espera de mí un poco lo que espera de, de lo que espera de los autores latinoamericanos. 
So once I come here, I have to think I'm coming and I have no audience. And I suppose that the American audience is expecting from me what they expect of Latin American authors. ¿Qué esperan los norteamericanos? Creo yo, según mi punto de vista y mi, y, y mi experiencia con la, en la academia acá de los latinoamericanos. So well, what they think, according to my uh, point of view uh, of Latin American uh, writers. Para mí es difícil porque hay, 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 hay un equívoco. Se supone que yo vengo huyendo de una, dicta, de una dictadura de izquierda o, o de un gobierno de izquierda. So it's difficult because there's a sort of equivocal thing. Supposedly I'm running away from a left-wing dictatorship. Y esa cuestión parece que no se entendiera a veces. Eh, uno por lo general debe venir, un latinoamericano debe ser anti-norteamericano en principio venir huyendo de un gobierno que ha sido instaurado o promovido por Norteamérica en, en, en Latinoamérica. So sometimes that's not understood because a Latin American author in the U.S. is supposed to have been running away from a right-wing uh, dictatorship that would have been established by the American government. Y ser profundamente anti-norteamericano es una, es, una, 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 es una contraposición, o sea, es... Para un latinoamericano, un escritor latinoamericano, lo políticamente correcto es ser anti-norteamericano. And so for a Latin American author is expected to be anti-American. That would be the logical thing. Eh, no es que yo no, no es que yo carezca de crítica con respecto a lo que está pasando acá, pero necesariamente no quiero, probablemente no llene esas expectativas en las cosas que estoy haciendo. No escribo realismo mágico. Estoy apartándome un poco del realismo político y estoy asumiendo, estoy, estoy tratando de interpretar mi realidad desde usa, usando, mezclando muchos géneros. So uh, it's not that I, there's a lack of criticism uh, that I have, you know, towards here, but uh, it is not. I'm not uh, writing for political realism. I'm not uh, writing. Uh, <coughs> Uh, no, uh, magical realism, sorry, yeah. or uh, I'm not writing uh, politics. Oh, I, I should no. say one thing. There's a sign on the wall behind you, and I should warn you, it says this area is monitored <laughs> under 24-hour video surveillance. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to cut you off there lest you say something that gets you into trouble. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Kenan, your book is being translated now into Bosnian. And I wondered if you're going to be making changes to react to the home audience as opposed to writing in your book. There are many footnotes and sort of asides that would explain uh, the Bosnian situation to an American. So when you go back and writing this, are you going to censor yourself at all or edit those footnotes? Or? No, I've, it's, the story is like totally unfiltered uh, for all the audiences. Uh, my first concern when I spoke to the publisher was who's going to translate the story. I wanted to know the name of the person, basically her, you know, him, his or her ethnicity. Uh, being it's like very pro you know, Bosnian book, I didn't want anyone outside my ethnicity other than being Bosnian to translate it. Because I had an article, uh, the Marshall Tito in Queens, the bar that was translated, took by a uh, European Serbian um, magazine, and they totally t changed the story around. And I started getting like, really hateful emails, because that's not what I wrote. So when I called her up and got in touch with her, she's like, I understand why you call me. We, I, went, I went through this with the editor, and don't worry, my name is, she told me her full name, and she said I'm going to translate word for word. And she's really good at translating uh, from American colloquialism to uh, Bosnian. Well, Susan, did you have to learn a lot about the situation uh, culturally and, and really begin yourself? Become yeah, it's funny, because um, I've written three memoirs, so I love memoirs. So when we handed in the first version to this uh, this brilliant editor, uh, Wendy Wolf at Penguin. She said, um, I love every single word you've written now, just add 100 pages of Yugoslavian history so Americans <laughs> will understand it. Um, and the biggest challenge that Kenan and I had was, um, I love the, it, it's sort of, it's very fast paced, almost like a mystery story. So I didn't want to all of a sudden like make the reader you know, go read two pages of Yugoslavian history. So he he really helped explain it to me, and also figure out ways that we could sneak in the history. Um, you know, without without leaving the narrative. So just for an example, in in one of my books, 
I wrote about my, my crazy Jewish family in Michigan. They're all doctors, and so they play a game at dinner, which is the disease game, where one says the symptoms and the other diagnosis. So it's 42-year-old Cambodian refugee vomiting blood, schistosomiasis, past the potatoes. So I said to Kenan, do you have anything in your family, like the way that you guys talk, um, the way that you learned history? And he said, yes. And he said that instead of like hanging out and eating Doritos and watching football games, what he and his brother and his dad do, because they're all fitness guys, they eat, they chop up vegetables, and on a Saturday or Sunday, they'll turn on the military channel, and there's all these weird World War I and World War II videos, which I actually watched, and he said what'll happen is he'll ask his dad questions, or his brother will jump in and say, you know, while they're talking about, oh, a Serb started World War II, did you know that guy? And he'll jump in, and they'll fill him in on the Bosniak history, which he felt had, had completely um, been erased. And so I, so not only did I watch the video with him, and I had him and his brother. I'm like, tell me what you would say. So we wrote it down. So it was this crazy war game that that caught him up. So so that was one way we did it. Um, the funniest thing, the, the funniest problem we had because he really speaks English eloquently, and even the way he leaves out words and connectives is kind of poetic. The funniest problem we have is middle-aged Jewish woman versus a younger um, male Bosnian man. And so when I was writing it, or when we were writing it together, and he would tell me a story and I would write it, he was very, we were very conscious of we wanted it to always sound like a male voice. So he would tell me a story and I would write the words and say, um, you know, after he broke up with someone, he was heartbroken. And he would read it out loud and he would cross out heartbroken. He would say, pissed. So he was like, that's a chick word. Don't use chick words. So actually the funniest translation problem we had was he didn't want me to sound like, you know, I'm an over-therapied, older female and he wanted to make sure that it was like a you know a young guy who's into sports and Seinfeld reruns and don't don't wreck the voice so that was actually our funniest uh, well I was issues. pleased to see that football was still football yeah. not soccer Vanessa the original title of your book I believe was the un-american yeah. and in writing the novel did you have to make yourself strange to yourself and if so how do you do that in a technical sense with craft? Um, well, I think that's interesting because yes, I did, and I think um, what we were, what I was talking about before, the first question you asked about um, being exiled from this family history, because again, the novel is inspired by family history. It was history that I did not know. I did not know the story of um, my father's side of the family, so that in itself um, made me feel. Um, on American because I realized that my um, that part of my identity um, as an American was that I had a grandfather who was deported and um, I feel like we're talking about exile um, and I'm surrounded by people who are living in exile and writing in exile um, I feel a couple generations removed as if I'm a child of exile and the result of what's happened um, in my family and um, I think in terms of discovering that family history, it, it, um, um, it distanced m me from m my sense of who I was as, as an American. So I think in that way, I, I, I realized I had this history um, that was very un-American and in some way was the sort of uh, story of the thwarted American dream. Um, and um, um, if, if I did anything else, um, in terms of the structure of the book, yes. Um, I think the fragmented nature of the story, which is that it um, goes back and forth in time and moves from uh, Connecticut in 1919, that's something that we share in common, so we should talk about Stratford and Connecticut, um, 1919 and 1920 to um, Russia in 1921 to Constantinople and Paris following Russian emigres and then to Mexico City, um, the novel just shifts back and forth in time and space and I really wanted to juxtapose time periods and countries and give the reader that sense of, um, of, of what it might be like psychologically to, to live through something like that. Um, so I think the structure of the novel definitely spoke to that idea of, of, of um, being on American, not having sort of a cohesive. Well, now that you've finished that novel, have you excised exile and are going to begin to thinking a different way? Um, that's very interesting because I feel like um, all writers are in some way living in, in 
an exile, as you were saying, like you were, you had, um, there's a psychological exile and then there's the physical exile. Um, and I think, um, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot more, um, themes of exile and, um, um, alienation, uh, that will play a part in my other books. 